podcast Timothy Chow lecturer at Stanford University talk about the world of IoT and its future so stay tuned So welcome everyone to another episode of Future of Data podcast today we have with us an amazing guest uh, Timothy Chow he's a lecturer at Stanford University and uh, and lots and lots of other things so do uh, to, to as a quick bio so Timothy Chow has a has a career spanning through academia successful startups and large corporations he was one of the only a few people to hold president title at Oracle as a uh, As president of Oracle on Demand, he grew the cloud business from its very beginning. Today, that business is over two billion. He wrote about uh, the move of application to the cloud in twenty two thousand four in his first book, The End of Software. Today, he serves on the board of Blackboard, a nearly seven hundred million uh, vertical application cloud service company. After earning his PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Illinois. he went to work for tandem computers one of the original silicon valley startup um, had he understood the stock options he would have joined earlier uh, he's he's invested in and been a contributor to number of other startups some of uh, that you have heard of is like webex and the others you have um, not heard of or sold to cisco and oracle today he is focused on several new ventures in cloud computing machine learning and the internet of things with that Thank you so much Tim uh for um joining our podcast and sharing your insights with our team. Well, you know, thanks for inviting me. I think it's going to be fun. It's I think so uh, thank you so much uh, Tim. So when I was looking at your profile it was um it was a journey. It was a journey like I was trying to figure out. I was trying to scroll down scroll down scroll down. Like you have so much things going on. Um so I said you will be a fabulous guy um to be on the podcast and I, and I do appreciate you um quickly jumping in and offering to help and 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 sort of pitching in to sort of contribute so why don't we start with your journey like what's from start to 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 till till yesterday or maybe today uh what has been the journey like we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast well you know uh, uh, dr rikpitch but you know i i started out like you know most people I, you know you get out of school with an engineering degree and uh, and so i went to work as the bio indicated for one of the original kleiner perkins startups tandem computers um and uh right away started out in operating systems and software and you know over time as i think most people in tech know you know as the stack moves up you kind of keep moving forward in what you uh where your expertise is so you know i moved into database and you know into applications um as you've already heard i kind of could understand that the next step in enterprise applications was really the move to delivering them as cloud services fundamentally for economic reasons and then um you know i i left oracle god now it's been about 10 years ago and i was kind of curious about well what was the answer to the question of what was next for enterprise software you know we built hr erp crm applications as quote on premises and then you know we moved them into the cloud but fundamentally the function was no different so i was uh you know very kind of curious about what was next i hope we had some creativity left so um uh in parallel i've been lucky enough to when i came to silicon valley also start teaching at stanford so i actually start teaching real stuff uh computer architecture uh, amazingly enough before you could get an undergraduate degree in computer science at stanford it's been that long so um i uh i taught for 15 years uh as in a weird way as a hobby i worked all the time and during that period but um there came a day where i had to actually fly to bali uh to do a sales kickoff and get back in 24 hours to teach class and i was like god this is getting crazy <laughs> so i uh i took a leave of absence uh i went back 
uh, after my stint at Oracle, and they said, oh, come back and teach. And I went, God, it's a lot of work. So to teach a seminar class. I went, oh, you know, I've been a manager for a lot of years now, so put great opportunity and great people together, and you don't have to do any work. I always tell people that's the secret of management, right? So um, we started this class. If your listeners are interested, check it out, cs309a.stanford.edu. Uh, I do the first and last lecture, and in between I have guest lecturers who uh, are really a who's who. Uh, early on, people that I knew, uh, you know, uh, Mark at Salesforce, Sue Breyer at WebEx, et cetera. And over time, I discovered that I could pretty much ask anybody and so, you know, we've had the CEO of Kaiser, the vice chairman of General Electric, um, and on. And uh, quite by accident, I had the um, CEO of VMware, uh, Paul Moritz, uh, one year. And one of his people ended up going to General Electric. And uh, so I got a email saying, well, would you be interested in having Bill Rue do your class? And I said, well, you know, the Valley's small. I would heard GE was doing something. And I said, but I don't really know what. And they said, well, come over and visit. So I went over and visited. Uh, it kind of opened my eyes. I was thinking, wow, you know, in tech, we pretty much just focused on a couple of industries, you know, financial services, a little bit of retail, uh, telcos, et cetera. But, you know, I'd never talked to anybody in mining or oil and gas or all these infrastructure industries. And so uh, about three years ago, uh, I like to say I pushed all my chips in and uh, really thought that this was an answer to what was the next step in enterprise software. Um, so I, uh, some people find this amusing, uh, but I figured I really didn't know anything because I thought this whole IoT thing was about toasters talking to coffee makers, and I <laughs> never understood why anyone would care. <laughs> so... Uh, I thought, well, maybe I better get educated. So I decided to write a book. So uh, the book Precision is really both a, and you know, we'll discuss it during our talk here, is both a technology framework that um, people from both the business and technology side can understand, and then followed by 15 different case studies that cover you know, all the big industries, agriculture, construction, healthcare, oil, gas, power, et cetera. And uh, that really kind of spurred my, you know, entry into this whole thing, both from a public speaking point of view and then uh, also from an investing point of view. So I became the chairman at the Alchemist Accelerator, focused just on IoT. And then uh, over the past several years, working with a number of different, because obviously where I live, a number of different startups and machine learning, artificial intelligence, next generation applications, security, et cetera. Because I, uh, I really believe uh, we are sitting at the beginning uh, of a whole new generation of technology for things and not people, as I like to say. So I don't know if that, that's a long story. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I think it's, it's awesome. And, and, and by the way, thank you so much for walking us through. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Uh, yeah. That's a fabulous job. And I think one thing, uh, even when I was looking at your profile that I noticed, uh, which was pretty pretty exciting observation. I don't know if you are, you are actually living that observation. So you, you were slightly uh, like, earlier pretty much on the time when it comes to selling cloud say selling cloud to oracle right and you yep. published a book about end of software pretty sort of uh, very bold uh, sort of concept at that point when everyone is pretty much holding on to their enterprise architecture and f folks are still figuring out their it infrastructure and all that and you're saying no no let's now let's focus on the cloud right and and now i i'm seeing that this almost a similar trend the iot is almost we is almost getting into the hype cycle of IoT. We don't know whether it's tested. We don't know. We know it's a lot of, it's making a lot of buzz. It's creating a lot of security havoc and all what and whatnot. And again, you you are back at it again saying, okay, just like it's IoT is a, is, is, is a radical good thing. So one thing that that I definitely sort of see in your pattern was sort of getting early and, 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 
and sort of communicating the message of disruption right and coming to, to your leadership what has been that like uh, if if you if you recall your cloud days in oracle uh how like what are some of some of the some of the struggles or some of the hurdles that you had faced convincing the idea of the cloud is a relevant thing uh for where their entire business model is all about enterprise architecture and when sort of businesses are more securing their it vaults they talk no let's let's go to the cloud and let's not focus on the software anymore so what are some of your thoughts there well i think you know trans transition transformation in the tech business i mean it's been with us for quite some time right i mean whether that was move from mainframe to many computers uh, many computers to client server client server to the internet um etc and uh, i think every time it's you know it, transition is not really a technology issue mm. it's a people issue <laughs> unfortunately or whatever fortunately i think a lot of people you know i've heard this comment made many times mm. right which is in the cloud was well you know you can't move to the cloud it's not secure you can't move to the cloud it's not performant right and i i tell people i said boy i heard that in the world of client <laughs> server you can't move to unix because it's not secure right <laughs> and and every transition i think this is what people miss is people focus on the technology and so then they're critical of the technology because obviously the new guy is not as mature as the guy who's been around so you know IBM DB2 or you know MVS to go all the way back was a much more mature operating system mm -hmm. and a much more mature database system than what was happening in the quote client server world but the thing i think people miss is that the economics are completely different right and while it may not be better if it's 10 times cheaper it allows people to do things they've never done before So the cloud, you know, just to speak to it for a second, I always tell people this isn't an issue of whose data center. This is an issue of economics, right? Mm. I you know, I, I, and the example that I use was is I uh, actually started t teaching a class in cloud computing at Tsinghua University in Beijing and um this is now 8 9 years ago and I've known the Amazon guys for a while and they gave me $3000 worth of AWS time. So I showed up in class and I said, "Hey guys, we got $3000 worth of AWS time. That'll buy you a computer in Northern California, Virginia, or Ireland for three and a half years." And they all looked at me and went, "Yeah, so what? I could have a <laughs> machine in Beijing for three and a half years." I go, "Well, yeah, I agree." I said, "Or $3000 will buy you 10,000 computers for 30 minutes." Mm. You know, and you go. Nobody's ever given anybody ten thousand computers for thirty minutes for three thousand mm. dollars. And it's these economic shifts that really drive everything. And I think people mistake a technology conversation with the economics. And I think what we're seeing now in the Internet of Things is fundamentally a move to machines being more hunks of software. and fundamental movement from business models that we've already seen in the software business now starting to play itself out um in the world of machines or in the world of things and i think that transition is going to it may take longer this is a curious question mm. i always tell people this isn't a you know it's not a matter of whether it's going to happen you know the debate is the rate right and i think the the challenge problem in the world of things is the things themselves right so this is why financial services has moved much more rapidly with technology mm -hmm. than any other sector because they have no really no physical world to deal with right whereas if i build tractors or you know steam turbines or gene sequencers or whatever right i i have a physical world to deal with um so this may slow things down the other way to look at it is it may open up new opportunities for people that you never thought of before to build next generation machines which are already highly connected um that they build next generation digital service products around and ultimately deliver as as services machines you know we've talked about software as a service right. we're not far away from machines as a service and that That's interesting is, yeah it's had as hugely disruptive effect on the 
software and hardware business, I'll call it my business, right? Mm. And I'd look at the guys who make, you know, combine harvesters, blood analyzers, <laughs> right? Forklifts, et cetera. And I go, you know, guys, is I can tell you the story of what's happened on my side of the fence. There's no reason it's not going to happen on your side of the fence. And so either you're going to be, you know, aggressively moving forward or you're going to get left behind. And I, I, you know, the road is littered, I'll call it on my side of the fence, with people who are late. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting. Interesting. I think that's that's very well put by the way tim i think that's one one thing um, that that I, I definitely want your perspective on um is you said uh, that the technology economics uh, interaction right so now you coming from the technology bent of mind right so you come up come up with this concept of and they, they, you are seeing some of the some of the economics uh, economic challenges uh, with the concept of say cloud as a technologist, what are some of the things that, that you had done or you could recommend to, because like in data science, whether it, whether it's IOT, whether it's machine learning, AI, like we are seeing a lot of these um, disruptive trends almost today nowadays. And we are seeing like folks who are from the coming from the technology end, they can see probably through to through why it makes sense, but they don't connect the economic dots to, uh, so far, how you, they can. So what are some of your thoughts in, um, what are some of the hacks that you could use in communicating this this message of, hey, bring the bring the economics uh, in, into conversation as well because that probably will dictate your business future, not that much of technology as such. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, you know, you're you're bringing about an interesting. I tell my Stanford kids, right? I I should teach you a little bit about selling, right? Because you know, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about selling in the conventional sense of the word, meaning closing a contract, or you're trying to sell ideas. Uh, you know, that's a fundamental thing you have to learn how to do. And so one of the things I tell people is I go, look, your biggest challenge is not selling an idea against something else. Your biggest challenge is selling an idea against the, we'll call it the entrenched, the existing, right? And I talk to people about what I call selling insight, teaching insight, mm -hmm. right? So what is an insight? And I, I use this in a very specific way. I go, it's the gap between where you are today and where you could be, right? Where you are mm -hmm. and where you could be. And I, I give people an example, not out of tech. I go, here, uh, Martin Luther King's speech, very famous speech. Uh, I have a dream. I have a mm -hmm. dream that one day my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their heart, right? Mm -hmm. So I go, okay, for a second, get rid of the not part. I have a dream that one day my children will be judged by the content of their heart. Well, we all agree. We go, mm. hey, Martin, I agree. What are we doing out on the mall? Let's go home, right? Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I go, Martin Luther King's challenge was not teaching you to judge his kids by the color of their skin. Mm. It was teaching you to not judge it, you know, mm. not judge it by the color of their skin. The not. And I said, Anybody who's done enterprise selling, and I'll talk about this only as enterprise selling, we've all seen this. I go, you walk in the meeting, you deliver the, I call it the, my baby is beautiful speech, mm, right? Mm. This is my cool technology. This is my cool solution. It's cheaper, better, faster. And everybody in the room goes, you know, you're right. Your baby is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go out of the room, everybody's fist bumping. Hey man, I closed the deal. I got this, right? <laughs> and then. I ask people who sell, I go, what happens next? And anybody who's honest answers, well, nothing, nothing happens. And I go, why does nothing happen? Nothing happens because the challenge is not, you know, delivering the my baby is beautiful speech. The challenge mm -hmm. is teaching them the not. Why mm -hmm. should they not do what they are currently doing? Mm -hmm. And you know, to bring it into the world of AI and, and whatnot, I, I say to people, because if you look at the type of data that's coming off of machines, I mean, machine data is huge hunks of time series data. Mm. I mean, modern wind turbines have 500 sensors on them. They spit out data once a second, 
right? If I'm a supplier of these, I probably have at least 10,000 of them in the field. I mean, anybody who thinks they're going to attack this problem with, quote, BI technology, I'm going to suck it into an Excel spreadsheet and rotate it or pivot it or whatever. <laughs> like, are you nuts? I mean, what does visualization has no meaning, right? I mean, how do you mm. do anything with it? And, and I tell people, I go, look, at the end of the day, and this is an education cycle, you got to go, look, what is going on in AI right now is really that, you know, people are learning that, you know, the confluence of three major things, huge amounts of compute horsepower back to cloud computing for no money mm. to these modern, modern, they're not actually that modern. I mean, most of this neural network technology was developed 20 years ago. It's just, you never could compute on it, right? So these learning networks, deep learning, neural networks, convolutional, recurrent, right, et cetera. Uh, now the algorithms are there, right? Mm. And then the third major thing is we're now starting to have data, right? And the, if you can throw huge amounts of data with lots of compute, you can do lots of interesting things. And on the consumer side, we're seeing it. You know, whether you want to look at as Alexa or you want to look at it as Google Translate, right? Or you want to look at it as, you know, uh, AlphaGo. I mean, these are mm. all examples from consumer side of starting to harness this technology. But to your original question, if I'm a guy trying to sell this, right, I got to convince you that the thing you're doing today is not going to work. Mm. I have to sell the not. And I, I, I tell people, here's two examples from the world of tech that everybody should know. When Salesforce first started selling, if people remember, their logo was no software. Mm. It was a big software with a mm. knot through it. Right? Mm. Well, I, I tell people, I go, well, if I was delivering the My Baby is Beautiful speech, I should say, mm. oh, uh, buy my software because it's uh, you know uh, ten times better uh, lead management, uh, five times better you know to close, yeah, all that, right? That's the classic CRM you know, value prop, so to speak, the elevator pitch. Well, Mark didn't do that, right? He went out there and said, you know, basically the way you buy, manage, install software is stupid, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, Don't do true. that anymore. That's, that's a good right? point, yeah. You yeah. know, and for the one in 10, by the way, if you're in a startup environment, it's the one in 10. Mm. For the one in 10 who go, you know, you're right. You say, well, let me show you this thing called CRM, right? Hmm. Uh, I'll give you another one out of the world of tech. People don't think about. There's a company out there called SanDisk. Hmm. Uh, if you know what they do, right? They they build flash memory, right? If you hmm. ever look, look at their name, I mean, I've never <laughs> talked to the founders about this, but you're like <laughs> SanDisk, no disk, right? Right? I mean, what their biggest challenge was: don't use rotational disk, right? right? So, the hack, so to speak, hmm. is you know or the insight is really people need to think about this because status quo is the easy, is the easiest thing to do. It's mm. the most comfortable thing to do. And, and anybody who's trying to take people to the next level, cloud computing, IOT, security, whatever, you have to be conscious of the fact that the challenge isn't delivering the, my baby is beautiful speech. The challenge mm. is teaching the not. Interesting. Well said. I think that's, um, thank you so much for 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 uh, for sharing your insights on that. So yeah. now now let's let's talk about your book. I think so. Um, in your book, I think one thing that I I really liked about um, so it was um, the quote on it's it's no longer about um, uh, Internet of People. It's more about Internet of Things, right? So uh, what like can, can you sort of justify that? Like what what were you trying to say with that? Yeah. Um... Uh, well, first of all, thanks for reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous uh, book, by the way. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'll do, rec I'll uh, do recommend uh, people. Your, your commission checks in the mail. So uh, <laughs> uh, the observation, and by the way, this is why I kind of went, crap, you know, it's a huge opportunity here. The observation that I have made with people is that most of the technology we have built, most of the software we have built up until now has been for what I like to call the Internet of People, meaning that it's mm. for people. So whether you want to think about that as a CRM application or, you know, an e-commerce application, at the end of the day, we think that 
you know, there's a human at the end of it, right? Which mm. is why I call it the Internet of People, right? And uh, I like to say this. I do a reasonable amount of public speaking. I said, you know, uh, my Stanford students pay a lot of money to hear this, but this is the tremendous insight. Things are not people. <laughs> uh, things Very are not point. people. Yeah, <laughs> people are not things. So I I'm going to take you through five reasons why things are not people and just kind of highlight this. So the first is there's going to be way more things connect the internet mm. than people. I mean, John Chambers has been out there talking about 500 billion things connect the internet. Well, mm. that's literally 100 times the global population. Right? Mm. Um, I spend time over in the healthcare area. You'll talk to healthcare CIOs and they'll tell you this is already true in, in the hospitals out there. There are way more things connected than people, right? Number one. Number two, I like to say things can be where people aren't, right? So things can mm. be in your stomach, the smart pill. Things can be a mile underground in a coal mine. Things can be out in the middle of the Australian outback. So mm. things can be where people are not. Number three, things have more to say. I mean, if you think about it, you know, all we can do is we can type a little bit, move a mouse around, click a little bit. Uh, modern day wind turbines have 500 sensors on them. I mean, they, they have mm. way more to say <laughs> than we humans can ever do. Number four, things can talk much more frequently. Mm. So in the coal mining industry, there's a machine out there called a long wall shear. Um, it's uh, basically three football fields long, 100 meters high, and it scrapes uh, coal out of a coal seam. And as it's digging through the coal seam, it forms what is referred to as an artificial roof. Every once in a while, as it's digging through, the roof collapses. Well, when the roof collapses, they have to go dig out their $100 million machine, right? So what do they do? They put a bunch of vibration sensors on top of the machine and mm. they're using it to try to predict roof collapse right those sensors are running at 10,000 hertz 10,000 cycles per second that is mm. way faster than any humans ever going to be able to type right right and I'll, I'll go to the fifth reason and and we can debate this but <laughs> things can be programmed <laughs> people can't <laughs> right so if at the end of the day you understand that things are not people, then the question I have put in front of everybody is why would the technology we built for the internet of people work for the internet of things? And hence my belief in a huge next generation of uh, technology innovation. Interesting, interesting. So, um, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing your thoughts on that. So. What what is what is the thinking about then? Um, so what is the what is the future of IoT as per you? Like what what do you think where it's going? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I always has, you know, this word Internet of Things. I, I made comment earlier. I think you know some, some people think it's toaster stock and coffee makers. So what I I kind of had to do was try to think about a framework that I could talk to business people and technology people in to try to explain a little bit of. I'll say where we are today, but also really to kind of tee into the question you have, which is, well, what does the future hold, right? Mm. Um, so I, I split it into five major pieces, which, you know, I think make it a little simple. Let's talk about the thing itself. Uh, you know, the machine is another way to talk about this. How is the thing connected? Uh, what can you do to collect data from these things? What can you learn from them? And finally, what would you do differently? Uh, I'll just take a moment and make a point here. You know, in the world of IOP, we built, we had to build applications that did something, right? CRM, e-commerce, so that humans would be enticed to type or click. And then we could collect a bunch of data and learn on it. That's pretty much the history of all the BI work out there. And I tell people, well, this is really interesting. In the world of things, I don't have to entice the machine to talk to me, I turn it on, it's going to talk all day and all night. Mm. So we actually have the opportunity to learn from our machines before we figure out what we're going to do, which is entirely different than the world of, of people. So let, let's start with things. 
uh, one, of the, one of the things I would tell people to think about is a lot of what has been driving this is the decreasing cost of sensor technologies, right? Mm. And this is being driven by the cell phone industry. Um, if your listener pulls out their cell phone and looks at it, I'll describe it. It basically has 12 sensors on it. Uh, it has a proximity sensor, gyro, uh, moisture, magnetometer, uh, barometer, accelerometer, right? 12 different sensors. There's actually a cell phone in Japan, which has a radiometer on it. Right? You might guess why. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is causing accelerometers, which are pretty exotic technology. They today are quantity one, two bucks, right? Mm. So the cost of these sensor technologies is going down, down, down. And if you hold that, that cell phone up and look at it, you can think, wow, here are 12 sensors talking to a big computer with a lot of storage, a lot of memory that talks to three different networks. So I ask people at what point in time will we see, I like to call it a cell phone inside every machine. Because hmm. if you become a student of this and, you know, you go look at the book and it'll show you a bunch of examples. The computing inside these machines is primitive by all of our standards, right? Hmm. Uh, I mean, 8-bit microcontrollers, hardwired things, PLCs, all this stuff. It's primitive, right? And if you think about it, that cell phone with the capability it has from a compute point of view, I mean, it, if I took the fancy screen off of it and the fancy case, it's probably 50 bucks, mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So the concept that I could put a lot of computing inside these machines is mm. economically now possible. Uh, what is that going to let us do? I mean, everything from, and people obviously are thinking about autonomy, but I mean, mm. it's, it's really almost the ability to start to rethink even the fundamental stack on these things because if you think about it, whether it's Android or iOS, these were all built for people, right? Mm. I have to build UIs and all this sort of stuff. Machines don't need all that. Mm. I have the opportunity, by the way, for people interested in security, to engineer security in from the beginning because most of what's happened in the world of IOP is we had to glom it on at the end to our laptops or our cell phones, et cetera. So the ability to start to move to software defined machines where I'm putting a ton of compute horsepower on these machines themselves, I think is the future of the machines themselves. Okay, I've got now smarter machines. But by the way, I, uh, I may mention I teach a class at Tsinghua University. One of the things I do is I um, go and visit some of my former students. Mm. And uh, one of them actually works at a company called Xiaomi which I know some of your listeners may know, but some may not. Xiaomi is actually the world's largest cell phone manufacturer. They build 80 million cell phones a year. Right? The reason you haven't heard of them is that you don't live in China, right? Because mm. that's their dominant market. Uh, so we're talking, they said, oh yeah, uh, we're starting to saturate the market. I go, well, that's interesting to think about, right? And uh, so they're starting to move into India, obviously, mm. right? Mm. Uh, but they're also starting to look at new products. So this is a very Chinese product. Um, I said, like, what? Yeah. Oh, an air purifier. <laughs> I mean, if you're aware of the air quality in China's major cities, you completely yeah. understand why there's a huge market in air purification. Mm. I, 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 I said, yeah, let, let me look inside that air purifier. Guess what you see inside? It's a cell phone. <laughs> The core compute is a cell phone. This is not too hard to believe if you know the history of Xiaomi, which is one of the original Android developer guys ended up being VP of engineering mm. over there years ago, right? So we're already starting to see this, quote, a cell phone inside every machine. But I think it, you know, the opportunity across all the major industries to vastly you know, move to what I like to call software-defined machines is, is there in front of us. Okay, so cool stuff about things. Uh, what am I going to do to connect them? Well, back to the world of IOP, we're pretty happy with having our 3G, right? 4G mm -hmm. network, a little bit of Wi-Fi. I made the point that, you know, things can be in a lot of different places. So I'll give you a simple example. There's a company out there called Sensium Vitals. They build a vital sign monitoring patch. 
So when you check into the emergency room, they slap it on you, uh, measures heart rate, respiration, like blood pressure, et cetera. Um, so the engineers made a conscious decision. They said, we do not want to put uh, a disposal, we do not want to put battery packs on it because if we put battery packs on it, we have to recharge it, right? Uh, we're going to have to wash the carrier, et cetera. Um, so we're going to go to disposable batteries. Well, as soon as they moved to disposable batteries, um, they couldn't use Wi-Fi anymore. No, they don't have enough power. So they ended up building a variation of a Zigbee mesh network. Um, so I say to people, if you think about the continuum of power requirements, data rate requirements, and distance requirements, we're going to see a whole bunch of different uh, networking technologies. Some of your listeners are familiar with LoRa, Sigfox, MBIoT at kind of the low end of it. Uh, but there's also a lot of interesting stuff occurring at the high end, uh, 60 gig as an example. So uh, again, I don't think we're done in the networking world uh, with just you know being happy with our 3G, 4G Wi-Fi networks. Once I connect these things, what am I going to do to collect the data from them? Um, well, today, if you look at what people are doing, you know, it's going into these time series databases, some into SQL databases, et cetera. But uh, I'll, I'll tell a story. There's a um, one of the latest oil drilling rigs out there in the Gulf of Mexico has 40,000 sensors on it. Mm. And uh, so I'm talking to the team and I said, well, uh, you, know, what are you, you know, what are you doing with all that data? And they said, well, most of it is digital exhaust. <laughs> <laughs> I love the phrase, right? <laughs> it's going into the air. They're, they're not doing anything with it, right? Yes. And I said, well, why is that, right? right. Well, it's clearly because someone, it doesn't take too much to calculate, you know, 40,000 sensors once a second, right, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to either make my favorite, you know, NetApp sales rep very happy happy or my favorite Oracle sales rep happy because it's going to be a lot of money to store that all in a very, in the conventional ways mm. that people think about it. Right. And I think we're going to have to see new ways of collecting data, uh, particularly, I think leveraging, we already spent a little time what's happening in the cloud relative to this and engineering that collection mechanism to be able to learn from that data. And um, I, I already talked a little bit about this, but uh, I don't think it's going to be around BI technologies mm. and visualization, et cetera. It's really we're going to bring uh, these AI technologies, deep learning technologies, et cetera, to bear on this. And so the way in which we architect the collection mechanisms, I think, will be much more driven by the use of it as opposed to, you know, just saying, well, I going to design a schema and park it in there, et cetera. And finally, um, I think on the do side, the application side, um, we're going to see new applications. I already made the point. Um, at, you know, these things are intelligent. So our whole way in which service may happen is let the machines call for service, not, you know, have humans do that. Have machines order from machines because they mm -hmm. know that they need this spare part. Uh, so we, whatever is going to happen in the middleware as well as in the um, package application space, I, I think will revolve around the Internet of Things, not the Internet of People. So I'm very bullish on technologies, new technologies across all aspects of this stack. And the uh, advent of the future of IoT is really a future of, as I said, a whole new generation of software technologies. Interesting. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We will continue the conversation in following podcasts. So stay tuned. I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. That's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the